history of brink locking, which was founded by my father in 1976, but the interesting part is he met my mother in 1960 in San Francisco, and she convinced him to go back and work with the family company that was located then in Joliet, Illinois, and that company was called the Folger Adam Company which is a well-known name in the industry. My grandparents decided to sell the company and my dad was left hanging there running the company at that point. Uh, and then he convinced the top engineer of Folger Adam at the time to come work with him, took him and the head of human resources and he opened up Brink Locking and started the company down in the basement of our house in Mayfield Avenue in Joliet, Illinois. And we developed the narrow jam lock, the model 3020, which is well known. And from there we developed the full line to compete with the other players in the industry. And we take great pride in, in the product we make. It's uh, designed and manufactured, assembled, and sold from here. It's all one company. We pioneered what is known as the narrow jam lock, our model 3020, and that was a unique proposition at the time. It was designed to appeal to the architect's need at the time for a softer architectural environment. And then since that time, we have developed the full line of products to accommodate all levels of security in the prison. And we do everything from the narrow jam lock, which is still a big seller, up to high security sliding door devices. As far as manufacturing, we manufacture all the parts in our, in our products here. All products except for castings, which comes from a foundry, we're not in the foundry business. But any other part, cylindrical in nature, or stampings, large or small, are all brought in here. We bring in the steel and we cut it out with our lasers, form it with our lathes, our CNC lathes, or sculpt it with our CNC mills. All parts are made here, and from there, we bring it up to assembly, and that's where really we you know, take great pride in our assemblers. Many of these assemblers have been with us for 35 years. So the amount of institutional knowledge, if you will, with our product is unparalleled in the industry. We've had very little turnover with our workforce. Many of them down there know the problems that the end user in the prisons come across. They, they know how to solve them themselves. And uh, that's a big advantage. That's what separates us from a, a, our competitors, I feel. Well, Poly Jail is an interesting uh, player in the market. They have done a great job uh, distinguishing themselves by offering service to an architect well, be, well before most of Poly's competitors get involved. They also have a lot of institutional knowledge um, that they offer the architect. Uh, they prefer a design-build method of getting the job out onto the street and uh, it's, in my opinion, proven uh, superior to other methods. Joe Poor knows who to call when he has a problem that can't be solved by normal channels. He, he'll call me at nighttime and we have a problem and it gets solved immediately and that's where Polly really can uh, shine for the architects and for the end users because Polly knows the owners and they can get results quick. Charlie, that was a great presentation, and while you were presenting, we actually got in a couple of questions for you. So if you're ready, the first question is, Charlie, when a criminal justice facility is in the design phase, do you have any thoughts on what should be considered when deciding if the secure door opening should be a swing door or a sliding door? And then second part of that question is, what are the trade-offs as far as R.R. Brink looks at it? That's actually a very, that's a good question. Through the years, we've seen these facilities built and initially an owner gets involved and he or she prefers sliding doors. Who wouldn't, right? You have total control of the opening remotely, monitoring and you know, traffic control over a swinging door, which you have to manually open. Um, and that's fine. But once they get into the actual practicality of all that, the money uh, is quite different. The differential between a swing door and a sliding door is you have to take that into account. And the other 
aspect of that, which I don't think many architects or end users consider later on, is the maintenance of a sliding door. And you know, we we think our sliding door is excellent, and it you know runs without with minimal maintenance. But like you see, elevators and, and skyscrapers or walkways in airports, they do occasionally go down, and you have to maintain it. And we always caution any owner or architect that be sure that you anticipate the maintenance required and the training required to maintain these sliding doors. You have to do that because eventually they will go down. Adjustments, just normal stuff, changing the oil in the car engine. And our experience has been in these prisons, a lot of times they don't anticipate that and then the, the, the imminent problem occurs and they sit and they just, they're not working for a long time. And so I would say, just make sure that when you specify a sliding door in a prison, be sure to allocate the proper resources for maintaining that sliding door. So. That, that's a great answer. And I think, uh... I think Paul, from Paula Jill's perspective, we would probably agree with you because as we have our own installation company, our, I can tell you right now, it probably cost us 20 man hours to install a sliding door device versus probably three to four to s install a swinging door device. So if you have a large group of sliders over, over an installation process, that's a lot of money that you add into the initial project. And then long term for the maintenance is a big issue. All right, Charlie, there was one other question that came up for you. What is the history of the mogul cylinder and what are the differences between the various mogul key cylinder offerings in the marketplace today? Uh, uh, the mogul cylinder was invented or pioneered, I believe, roughly around 1970. And the idea of it, hence the word mogul, larger, big, uh, was the, the internal workings of the key cylinder are all proportionally larger than your typical key cylinder, pin tumbler cylinder that you see on your conventional doors in your house or an office building. And the idea behind it was that prisons are a kind of hostile environment and you have the inmates trying to gum the works up literally and figuratively with a key cylinder. And, uh, so if everything's larger and made of stainless steel internally, it's uh, just, it works better long-term. It's easier to maintain. It's, it's more difficult to defeat the workings of it. As time went on through the decades, uh, making a key cylinder larger, you had to actually manufacture it yourself because the big manufacturers of key cylinders, Medico, Asa, Sargent, they didn't want to get involved with that niche market of a mogul cylinder. There just wasn't the volume there to support that sort of product for them. So over time, the various manufacturers, including us at one point, uh, uh, convinced the large manufacturers of pin tumbler cylinders to make a mogul cylinder, a larger cylinder, but they just utilize the same sized internal workings. Then around 1992 or so, we decided to actually make, go back and make the original mogul cylinder, which has the proportionally larger internal workings, pin plumber, springs, ball bearings, everything with a larger key, larger key way. And our competitors opted to go with, I, I believe most of them for the standard production locks. They provide the awesome mogul cylinder, which is a, a fine product but it's just the same smaller internal workings. For our standard production lock, we offer the mogul cylinder with the larger pin tumbler, pin tumblers and keyway and key. And we think that's superior. Um, I know the counterpoint to that is, well, Asa cylinders are difficult to pick. Well, our experience has been that picking inside, picking key cylinders inside a prison is just not an issue. It's a problem that's just, I've never heard of inmates actually successfully picking locks. I, I could be wrong, but I think it's extremely rare. 
And so we think the trade-off of having a bigger, a true, a true mogul cylinder with a larger internal workings is better for the end user. It's just the key cylinder is more difficult to jam up, to gum up, and it just works longer. And it's and you have the larger key. And our I, we just think that's a superior uh, solution for the end user. All right, those are great answers. They're really good questions, Charlie. And we will catch up to you later on in the webinar today when we're live with the Q and A.